All right. Um, so, um, Dharma and data management is the uh, name of the presentation. So I'll be talking a little bit about Dharma and um, or the Data Management Association, um, which is uh, what it's short for. And I'm also specifically going to um, to talk to you a, a little bit about um, some key concepts in data management that are important for analytics and especially big data analytics. So. Um, I've put some material together specifically for the group today, and I think it's going to take about half an hour, give or take. Um, and then hopefully we'll have, um, you know, a little bit of time if you've got any questions. Um, I guess starting with a little bit about me, um, I'm the president of Dharma Australia in 2021. Um, so I've been involved in Dharma for probably about 10 years, but uh, this year I, um, I am uh, privileged to be the president. Um, I'm also the managing partner at IMS, and we're a consultancy that specialises in data management and data governance and all those things that um, uh, we also espouse uh, in Dharma uh, as an association. Um, and I've been working myself with data since the 1990s, really the early 90s, if I was uh, to be truthful. So I've been around and working in um, in the data field for quite a while. And um, lately, I guess, um, you know, a lot of the work I do is in the government sector, um, you know, working for, for government agencies and departments, state, uh, federal, uh, local government, um, and mainly around data governance, data management, IT strategy, data strategy, and enterprise architecture. They're the main areas I work. Um, and personally, you know, my I guess my passions, um, and not in order of importance, as I've said here, data at the front, <laughs> family, um, you know, uh, kids um, and family are important to me. Football, which I was just talking about with Moaz a minute ago, and um, and I enjoy running. So uh, that's a little bit about me. So what about the Data Management Association? Um, so Dharma is the premier association for data professionals around the world. So it's not just an Australian association. In fact, Dharma Australia is one of more than 60 almost 70 chapters now um, uh, of Dharma chapters worldwide. So Dharma exists in um, in the United States, it, it's in the UK, across Europe, um, South America. Um, so it really is an international association and it has been around for quite a few decades. So we're not new to data. Um, we we have been working with data for, for, for a very long time. Uh, we exist purely to promote best practices in the management and use of data and information. So um, our mission is uh, to improve uh, the understanding and the practice of data management or through the practice of data management um, and sharing best practices. So we really wanna see the profession grow. Um, we wanna see um, you know, the standards lift um, and we wanna help that happen. Um, so that's what we're about at Dharma. We're not for profit, we're vendor independent, and we are comprised of a group of technical and business data professionals. And you're all welcome to join, and that's one of the things I'll be inviting you to do today as part of this presentation. I'll let you know how you can do that. Um, there is a Dharma branch in most Australian capital cities, so Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide um, and hopefully Darwin um, at some point this year. So, um, uh, you know, you'll have a local branch and you'll be able to join and, um, you know, we often do in-person meetings and hopefully with um, things getting a little bit better COVID wise, I'm hoping that that will happen more often um, again this year. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our Dharma branches. So Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. Um, they really do have a community feel about them. Um, you know, we've tried to create a, um, a safe space where people can meet and share ideas. Um, they usually are, um, um, you know, in a CBD location or a central location that everyone can get to. And they're usually after work. 
Um, so, uh, you know, we usually have a, a could be a 6 p.m. or 5.30 p.m. start, um, and you usually finish by about 6.37. Um, and um, we normally meet once a month, so give or take, uh, you know, there's usually somewhere between, you know, it could be 9 to 12 meetings a year, depending on which branch it is. Um, and normally that's in person, but lately it's been via webinar. And I think one of the legacies of COVID will be that um, we'll continue with the webinars because they have been very successful um, and we're getting, you know, usually around 100 or more, sometimes hundreds of people attending our webinars from around Australia. So one of the things I think we'll be doing going forward will be, um, you know, doing our branch meetings as webinars as well. Um, so one of the key aims of these meetings is to help our members develop their knowledge through relevant presentations and discussions. So often you go to a, a Dharma branch meeting or even one of our branch webinars that we're running now, and you'll see a case study being presented um, by an organisation or something on a best practice such as data modelling, um, or it could be even a vendor presentation on a on a data related product. Um, so it could be a, you know, a data virtualization product or a metadata management product. Um, and you can see actually there's a, um, um, a picture of me um, presenting uh, just before COVID, uh, probably one of the last branch meetings in Melbourne before we had to go to webinars, um, a, a presentation with the CFA about their uh, data, data lake, data hub, environment. Um, so, uh, so that's, um, you know, the sort of thing that we, we would do at a webinar or on a webinar or in a branch meeting. And one of the things um, that people really enjoy with the face to face meetings is that they get to network with the peers. Um, and often, you know, they'll meet people from other organisations in a similar role. Um, and, and, um, you know, they can share ideas. Um, and, you know, um, people have found the next project or the next contract or whatever it is at these meetings as well. So um, it's really a, a great opportunity to uh, to connect to other people and organisations that are doing things in the data space and also share some of your challenges um, with some of your peers and get some feedback and ideas about how they're doing and, and solving those problems. So. It's an excellent environment when we're meeting in person, um, you know, to connect to everyone. Um, okay, so what sort of resources do we have um, in Dharma that will help data professionals? Um, so the thing, one of the things we're, we're most known for is the a publication that we, um, we published, Data Management Book of Knowledge or DMBOC for short. Um, so the DMBOC has become the standard for a lot of large, you know, organisations, government organisations, um, banks, um, you know, big Australian companies use it widely. Um, it is a, a standard that can be used with large organisations, medium sized organisations and small organisations. So it's, it's quite universal. Um, obviously, a large organisation would need to um, implement aspects that perhaps a smaller one wouldn't, but nevertheless, as a collection of best practices, um, there, you know, there, there's lots of things that any organisation would benefit from by, by looking at the, uh, the DM BOC, as we call it. And side by side next to the DM BOC is what we call the CDMP or the Certified Data Management Professional Qualification. And that is the qualification that Dharma um, uh, oversees that is um, associated with the DM box. So there's different levels of that. And I'm about to tell you a little bit more about the CDMP. Um, but on top of the CDMP, we also uh, have just introduced um, and are developing a mentoring program for our members, um, which will allow them to be linked with um, more experienced practitioners and, and um, um, assist them in their career development. We also provide access to our webinars and branch meetings, that's recordings of them. And very often our presenters will allow us to share the, the presentation with their, uh, you know, with our members. So, so you can also download the PowerPoints or the, the presentations and use them if you've seen a slide or something that you, 
you think would be useful, you know, in your own um, organization. One of the other benefits um, is the fact that most of our members or our members automatically get discounts to most of the data conferences, um, you know, and, and often we get also um, a number of uh, free entry tickets. So that's not something you can rely on, but sometimes we'll get a, a you know, a conference and they'll say, you know, we've got 10, 10 tickets available to your members, you know, and we'll, we'll just put out a call to our members. If uh, someone wants a ticket to this event in Melbourne or whatever it is, we've got a few available. So, um, so it, you'll always be up to date with what events are on and often you'll get a chance to, uh, to attend or, or, or a discounted entry. Um, so who can use the DM BOC? Um, it's, it's, it's written for all sorts of um, audiences, um, data management professionals, IT departments, managers and executives, data stewards, knowledge workers, um, consultants, re researchers, educators, everyone um, will get some benefit out of that, this, this um, book. Um, it's not written for a specific audience. It is a collection of best practices. So it's not a recipe book where you have to read one end to the other. Um, you know, it's, it's um, a great, reference where you can go to it and say, so what, you know, what do we mean when we talk about data quality and what are the best ways to manage it? Um, so it, it's a reference guide that, that you can use uh, anytime you need to, um, you know, fill in the dots, so to speak. Um, some of the things that people use it for is, you know, we're sitting around the, uh, you know, the table in the, in the kitchen when we all used to work in the same place. And, um, you know, we're having arguments about, um, you know, what is metadata and, you know, how we should manage the data quality. So it's a great way to, um, to get some consensus, um, you know, having that reference guide um, and being able to refer to it uh, for definitions. Well, obviously, um, if I'm developing a data strategy, I want to make sure that I've covered all my bases, whether it be metadata management, master data management, um, data stewardship and what that means to my organization. So, so making sure that you're covering all the relevant aspects of, of your data strategy as a reference guide, which I've already alluded to, and as a basis for certification and training. So if you want to do the CDMP, it's the, it's the guide for that. Um, but it's also the guide um, for a lot of academic researching and research topics. So um, it's an excellent reference. And in fact, let me just, um, Grab my copy, which I keep on my desk. Uh, hopefully, you can see, see that. Um, it's quite a big book, um, but it's it's definitely worth having, and um, and um, you know I refer to it all the time. So um, so I definitely recommend getting your hands on that. And if you Google it, um, you'll find a link on how to get one of those. Um, and uh, if you're an organisation or a, a company, um, I would definitely recommend um, getting a copy. Um, for, for use, um, you know, internally. Okay, the CDMP, which is the um, um, qualification. Um, so it has various levels. Um, it goes, it starts from the associate level and works upwards. Um, and there's, there's different specializations as well. Um, and there's specializations around analytics and um, effectively, I guess, big data as well. So. So, um, yeah, I definitely encourage you to look at that. It's, it's becoming more and more recognized. It's been around for quite a while. Um, and if you go to the Dharma website, you'll find more information about that. So why would you want to, um, to get the CDMP? Well, as an individual, um, it definitely provides you a pathway for developing your knowledge in data. Um, it has excellent recognition in the in the marketplace in terms of a, especially in large organizations they do recognize it they know what dharma is they know what dmbok is and they know what cdmp is so um, as an individual it's an excellent thing to have on your cv um, and um, it, it's recognized by a lot of the large um, organizations that um, a lot of people in this field work for and with um, and as an organization, why would you want to put your people through it? Well, it's, um, it's definitely going to lift the standard, um, uh, increase the maturity. Um, it's an investment in your employees um, and their development. 
um, and uh, an investment in raising the quality of, of um, your data management. So, um, so they're all benefits of the CDMP. And if you're not a DAMA member, it's only a tax deductible $100 a year. So um, it's almost a no brainer really. And um, for corporates, um, I think last time I checked, it was actually for, for just a normal, typical size organization, $400. Um, and that includes, I think, um, five individual members um, as part of that. So, so um, you know, it's, it's an excellent investment. It really is a no brainer no brainer go to dharma.org.au and um and you can find out more and um and if you have any questions about it of course feel free to reach out um so i said i would um sell a bit of dharma and why the benefits are there and now i'm going to talk to you a little bit about data management and and um you know how how i think it can help you um in analytics and in specifically on the big data side of things um so what is data management um, well, I'll use um, the, the DM Bock and, and, and the Dharma definition. So it's a business function that develops and executes plans, policies, practices, and projects that acquire, control, protect, deliver, and enhance the value of data. And it really is a professional discipline. It's not a particular, you know, task or, or thing. You know, it is an overall profession, professional discipline, and it brings together a number of different capabilities. And this is the famous Dharma wheel, the DM Bok wheel that a lot of people refer to and use. Um, and, and this essentially um, defines these capability areas um, that are important to any organization that's managing a complex data environment. So, so that's um, the field of data management and, and all the various aspects of it. But the challenge today is that a lot of people have said, you know, this data management stuff, it's slowing us down. We've got, we're, we're, you know, we're digital today. Um, we can do things faster. We don't need to, you know, manage and govern the data. I'm sure you're all familiar with this story. Um, and uh, I know that, um, you know, it's something that we've all had to deal with, you know, that, uh, you know, let's just get the data and do something with it. We don't need to manage it. We don't need data warehouses. We don't need this. Just bring the data together um, and, and work with it. And we've even got a bunch of language that we've developed now, you know, to talk about this chasm between the, the data management world, if you like, and the digital world, you know, digital divide, digital transformation, digital natives, digital chasm, um, and all these things, uh, you know, are the way we describe this, uh, this, this, gap, I guess, between data management and, and uh, I guess, if you want to call it the digital approach. And, you know, um, I guess, uh, you know, some of the things we often see from people is um, comments that if we take this data management approach, it's going to slow us down. Um, you know, it adds bureaucracy, it adds red tape. And I often say to people, you know, if um, data management was a vegetable, um, I think uh, kale is a vegetable. Um, if data management is a vegetable, it would be like kale because uh, we're all told how good it is for us, but none of us really like the taste of it or like, or like it at all. Um, um, I guess the, the answer here is that, you know, we, we do need to find a balance that um, we can't just go um, into the Wild West and, and, and you know, sort of uh, have no standards. But on the other side, there is definitely such a thing as going too far on the standard side and the management side. So finding the right balance um, is the important challenge. Um, and why do we want to do it? Um, why do why do we just why wouldn't we just in, you know I guess ignore it completely? Well, um, you know we may have some new terminology for some of this stuff, but some of these problems have been around for quite a long time. Um, you know nowadays we talk about feature engineering in data science, um, and it turns out that uh, you know, 80% of data science time is go going towards you know, effectively uh, collecting, cleaning, and organizing data, much of which is data quality related, by the way. Um, and that's the exact problem that data management is trying to solve. Um, and you know, so this is the you know, result of a, a recent Forbes survey. Um, and you can see that, you know, the, the data science part of this is actually the smaller part. And the bigger part of it is 
this business of having to clean and organize the data. So, um, you know, I guess the first answer to the question of why should we do it is um, you're paying for it when you're not doing it. You, you know, you're just not going to be as productive. It's being done. It's just being done project by project, feature by feature, time and time again, often, you know. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons why we want to do it. Um, and uh, bear with me for a sec. Another reason why we want to do it is, um, and you as big data people probably know this, more devices are becoming in aware of their environment. And the reason for that is these, uh, these MEMS devices um, are becoming smaller, cheaper, and more powerful. Two to three dollars for a sensor that can tell its orientation, that can tell the temperature, that can tell all sorts of things. Um, and so they're just putting them on everything. Um, and these things are the things that are producing a lot of this data. And we don't have to look very far to see these chips um, appearing on all these devices that we know so well. Um, you know, our phone, just our typical cheap little phone has all these sensors on it um, and is constantly collecting data. Uh, but so too are processors, manufacturing lines, um, you know, um, your, your electricity meter, um, you know, they're all collecting data. So, uh, so we're being flooded by all this sensor data. And with these phones, on top of that, people are using these phones, you know, to post to, um, to Twitter, to Facebook, to all these things, and they're creating lots of unstructured data. So we've got the sensor data, and then we've got all these photos and what we call unstructured data, which is, you know, um, documents, records, uh, you know, audios, videos. Um, so more data coming in like that. And um, so the sensor data, the unstructured data, um, all these devices connected to the internet, and hence why we've got this idea of big data. Um, and in fact, I was just having a look before this presentation, um, you know, it's some statistics, and I've seen this gra graph before, but um, it's been updated here for 2021, 42.6 billion devices connected to the internet by the end of this year, apparently, um, and then probably doubling after that. Um, so, you know, the data is just becoming more and more ubiquitous. It's being collected everywhere. And, and uh, as big data practitioners, you know, the organizations you work for, have got this data flooding in and you need to be able to deal with it. And I said earlier that I'm into football, so this is my way of putting um, football into the conversation. Um, if, you, if, you, if you look at this, um, I'm going to the football on Friday and I'm going with a, a you know, group, of, group of friends and each of them has a different um, you know, way of getting into the MCG. Um, you know, uh, I've got my, um, my Richmond membership and Others have bought tickets. Uh, others have uh, pre-bought them and they got them, you know, through um, through the mail. Others have AFL members, um, and others are MCC members. And so, each of these channels has got a different, you know, data collection, data validation process. Um, in this example, you know, we needed the address of the person and the person's name in order to get the ticket to them. In this example, when they buy a ticket, say at the gate, uh, at the ticket um, booth at the MCG, we don't even know their name. You know, we just have given them a ticket. Um, so you can see each of these channels um, is going to create a different version of the of the data. And then at the gate, we have to make a decision as to whether we let them in or not. Um, so you know, the data has to be integrated and converge at the gate so we can make the decision but each of these channels has got different data collection. So that's another complexity that we have to deal with. And so how do we deal with that? So one of the key concepts that um, has developed in the data management world is the idea of master data management. And master data management was born actually in 1999 when um, this spacecraft that you see an animation of was supposed to go into orbit around Mars because it was a weather satellite. But instead, it ended up crashing on the planet. And when they did an inquiry, they found out that the contractor had used pounds of thrust to calculate the, th the, um, the thrust calculations, and NASA had used Newtons. 
And now that's incredible because they found that out right at the moment that the, um, you know, the, the, this thing is supposed to go into orbit. And, um, and in the end, uh, you know, they didn't blame any particular party for the problem. They just ended up saying that this was a lack of standard master data. Um, you know, there wasn't a standard for measuring thrust. And so each, each organization came up with its own, you know, standard and, and, and no one knew what the other one's um, standard was. So the lessons learned from that was over time, different parts of an organization and even different organizations develop their own terminology for the same things. Um, and you often see this in organizations, you know, as you go to one part of the organization and they talk about an account and they mean the, a financial account. And then you go to another part and they talk about an account and they mean a customer. So, you know, we see this problem all the time, you know, having that meaning and context. And often what happens is that people translate between the, the two, you know, languages, but that's not very scalable because you've got to maintain these translations. Who's going to maintain them? Um, and who's going to remember, you know, how you translate from this value to that value and so on and so forth. So, a better solution to this problem is master data management. And when we implement master data management, what we want to do is establish common business language and common standards for, for exchanging and sharing data. So we're not saying that you've got to go to all your systems and adopt this, you know, particular standard. But what we are saying is that when we, when we exchange data or we bring it together at an enterprise level, that we're going to do so using a standard and a common language so we all understand what it is that we're talking about with that data. And then we want to make sure everyone's using the same version of the data so that we don't end up with, you know, different versions or, or uh, you know, categories of, of things so that we end up with different reports, different analytics answers, you know. So, so having the same version of postcodes, of suburbs, of ABS, demographic codes, you know, that, that is really important. Otherwise, we're going to end up with different answers to the same question. And why else we want to do master data management is because those sensors that you saw before on your phone, which uh, if I was going to look at this machine data, it would mean nothing to me. You know, it would mean nothing to most of us. It's, it's meaningless to the business. It has to be converted into something that means something, you know, to the business. Um, the business can't make any sense out of someone's IP address, but they can make sense out of a person. Um, you know, uh, they may not be able to make any sense out of, um, you know, say, uh, UTC time. So we need to convert it into Australian Eastern Standard Time. So, so on and so forth. Um, so being able to convert this machine data into data that has a meaning to the business and this meaning that provides context is master data. And in this case, this is a police officer, person, location, vehicle, because this event is, say, the person getting a speeding fine. Um, and so here you have the master data converging at an event to provide the context that's needed to capture the event. And, uh, you know, that context may be captured by sensors or some of it anyway. Um, and so master data management is in important in, in providing uh, a common context for the transactions we capture. And another thing it does is when we do capture these things in different ways, here's an address on my iPhone and here's an address, you know, on an application, that we've got a way to standardise that um, into an enterprise standard and bring it together. So that's another key capability. And another key capability is something we often see in systems where we've got the same person who's been created more than once. Um, and this often happens with organizations that have got millions of customers or millions of assets. So it doesn't have to be a person, it could be an asset. Um, and so being able to deduplicate, as we call it, identify duplicates and, and then deduplicate and resolve those sorts of issues, that's another important capability that comes from master data management. And another thing we often see people struggle with is they say, well, where did this analytics or this report come from, what was, you know, what was the source and can I trust it? And with all of those things that I talked to you about earlier, bringing that picture together uh, is, is so hard. Um, this is just an example of people exchanging data um, and how quickly that data explodes 
and how we're supposed to then answer the question for someone who's over here, um, you know, where did this data come from? You know, it's almost impossible. So in order to do that, another thing we need to do is metadata management and data quality. So why is there a Big Mac on the screen? Well, I like to think about data quality a bit like a Big Mac, right? So is a Big Mac good for you or bad for you? Well, we, we can probably talk about that for a while, but what we can say is if we buy a Big Mac, whether I buy it in Melbourne or whether I buy it in Sydney or whether I buy it in Paris, I know exactly what it is I'm buying, what I'm going to get. And that's really what we need to do when we think about data quality. We need to shift from thinking about it as being bad or good to more being about what, it, what we expect the data to be. Because the judgment of whether the data is bad or good is really about the way that the data is used. If you think about a one week old exchange rate, if I was, um, if I was asked, um, you know, should we open an office in, in, in San Francisco, um, you know, uh, can you put a business case together? I could probably use a one week old exchange rate and say it's gonna cost us this much based on that exchange rate in Australian dollars. So, you know, you can make a decision whether it's viable or not. But if I also, if I got called, say, the next minute and asked, should I exchange this $1 million to Australian dollars now, I'd probably want a spot rate for that um, because, you know, I need to decide right now whether to do it. So in one instance, one week old exchange rate's fine and in another instance, it's not. So speaking to data, speaking about data quality is good or bad is not really a very sophisticated way of thinking about it. So instead, we've got to move to this uh, idea of making sure we understand what the data should look like, how old it is, what its data dictionary is, its format, um, how big it should be roughly in size, and then comparing the data that we acquire against what we expect and telling the user whether it is matching, you know, with what we expected. And then it's up to them to decide whether it's good enough for the particular purpose that they have in mind. And the other thing about data quality is there's two sides to it. There's the objective side, which is things like completeness and timeliness and, and you know, whether it's the right format and dictionary and all that. But there's also subjective data quality. And that's when someone says the data's crap. Um, you know, I don't believe it. Because often we've seen IT departments or data people trying to correct data that's supposedly crap. Um, and only to find out that there's nothing wrong with the data, but people are just saying that they don't like what the data says. So being able to measure um, subjective and objective data quality is important. And this is why we need metadata management, um, you know, so we can answer the data lineage problem and so that we can measure data quality. There's some of the things that metadata management enables. And then another thing that we need to do is make sure that we have uh, data governance organization in place with the key roles. And this is just a you know minor example here, where we define the responsibilities and the roles of each um, you know um, type of role, if you like, what you know, and we normally do that using a, a racy type matrix. Um, and uh, depending on the role, assign responsible, accountable, and so on and so forth um, a, across a range of data activities that um, you know can be undertaken in the organization so you know that's another key part of data management making sure that we have those roles and responsibilities so i've just given you a little bit of a flavor hopefully that gives you um you know a, um, a picture that it's not actually a chasm between digital and data management i think it's more a marriage and in fact i think they're a perfect match and and um, ideally, we should, you know, be marrying up analytics and, and, and data management and big data and, and both, you know, leveraging, I guess, the best of each other's uh, field and knowledge. So on that note, um, I'm happy to, uh, to, uh, to take any questions.